these affirmative action cases are the definitive word on the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. 14th Amendment. Um, that amendment was ratified in 1868, uh, and the clause itself uh, provides that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The precise meaning of the clause was uncertain from the beginning. Um, there were a variety of possible meanings, but, but two possible meanings emerged uh, in the course of time. One was that the Equal Protection Clause merely prohibited uh, racial and ethnic classifications, the sort of classifications that pervaded the South uh, before the abolition of slavery and the Civil War. Um, and were also prevalent in the Northern states. We sometimes forget that um, there was no slavery in the North, but there was plenty of racial discrimination before and after the Civil War. But in short, uh, under this anti-classification rationale, state governments could not discriminate or classify their residents on the basis of race. Um, a lot of members of Congress supported this uh, anti-classification rationale because they thought that racially neutral laws uh, would eliminate racial discrimination from society generally. Other members of, uh, of Congress thought that the clause had a broader and frankly more radical uh, purpose, uh, that of uh, anti-subordination, of prohibiting and preventing um, a racial caste system which would um, confine minority races and ethnicities to a permanent um, underclass or a permanent inferior status. Uh, state governments, in other words, were prohibited from entrenching or promoting white supremacy. Since racism pervaded society in uh, the South and to a large extent in the North as well, racially neutral laws would not be enough in this view. The government would have to, so to speak, lean into the wind. It would have to take positive or affirmative action to eliminate uh, racism in society. So these two classifications are in some tension with each other. Uh, an anti-classification understanding would invalidate any use of race uh, by the government, even to assist uh, racial minorities who suffered from historical discrimination. But an anti-subordination rationale would permit and might even require classifications designed to correct for the uh, persistent lingering effects, generational effects of racial discrimination. Um, both of these rationales appeared in Supreme Court opinions well into the 20th century, um, even towards the end of the 20th century. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education, and that's probably the most famous of the court's um, equal protection clause decisions. Uh, struck down the practice of segregating schools by race. So that's an anti-classification holding. You can't assign students to one school or another based on their race or their ethnicity. But it did so because uh, desegregation sent a message of African-American inferiority and white supremacy, and that's an anti-subordination justification. The tension emerged uh, in other places, uh, or I should say among other places, in admission to elite uh, private and public universities. These have long been viewed and in fact are in the United States vehicles for uh, economic and social advancement. Um, the uh, use of racial quotas and other so-called mechanical measures was struck down in the Bakke case in 1974. Um, 
uh, the court was badly split. As many people has, have observed, there were five or six different opinions. It was hard to figure out precisely what the holding was, but, but the opinion of Justice Powell emerged as, um, as the holding of the Bakke case, which is that race could not be used um, uh, as a mechanical measure, but could be used as a plus factor along with many other factors like test scores and grade point average, um, you know, special um, talents, musical instruments, singing, athletics, and so on could be used as a plus or tipping factor uh, among many others. Uh, that approach to race and admissions was uh, confirmed by uh, Gruder versus Bollinger in 2003. Um, that again was, uh, um, well, Gruder manifested both um, both of these anti-classification and anti-subordination uh, rationales. Uh, the anti-classification measure, of course, was the general suspicion or skepticism of race. And the anti-subordination rationale um, permitted the use of race as a temporary measure to ensure minority access to these elite uh, institutions of uh, higher education and all the advantages that came and that come with that. So racial and ethnic diversity in higher education was legitimized in 2003 as a compelling governmental interest that justified um, the use of race as a temporary measure to ensure minority access to elite uh, higher education. Uh, the cases decided that last week um, eliminated this ambiguity. Um, going forward, the Equal Protection Clause uh, is and will be understood as an anti-classification measure. Um, any sort of race-conscious decision-making, uh, with one sort of very narrow exception, uh, which I'll get to eventually, is, uh, is to be understood in anti-classification terms. Any, any sort of, any use of race, even when it's used to com combat um, uh, general racial discrimination or subordination in society or to correct for persistent uh, uh, societal discrimination will be found to violate the Equal Protection Clause the court listed a number of justifications uh, for this holding. Uh, first, uh, they found that the use of race and admissions, um, that the universities had not articulated a standard that could be judicially reviewed in a meaningful way. So if the point of diversity in higher education is to encourage uh, a robust exchange of ideas, to broaden understanding, to prepare students for life in a pluralistic society, um, to encourage innovation. These are all goals that were put forward by Harvard and by the University of North Carolina. Um, it's unclear how courts are supposed to measure whether and when these goals have been achieved. And uh, the court found that neither Harvard nor North Carolina had been able to articulate any standard by which a court could judge whether these goals had been achieved. Uh, second, the court found that the use of race was not um, closely connected to these goals of diversity um, in admissions. Uh, the precise racial classifications lump races and ethnicities together that have little in common. Um, 
examples the court pointed to were East Asians and South Asians uh, or African Americans and persons from Africa. Um, and they exclude others, such as those from the Middle East and North Africa, who are generally characterized as white. Third, uh, the court found that despite the university's best efforts and um, good faith, that um, the use of race in admissions negatively affected uh, persons of some races, notably white and Asian applicants, especially Chinese, those of Chinese and Japanese heritage. Uh, as the court stated, it demeans the dignity and worth of a person to be judged by ancestry instead of by his or her own merit and essential qualities. Um, the court observed that neither university, so this is a fourth rationale, neither university had offered a limit or an endpoint uh, for its use of race. In Gruder, the majority and all of the concurring opinions had emphasized that um, the use of race in admissions was, was to be a temporary measure, um, a transitional measure. Uh, Justice O'Connor even mentioned in her attorney, uh, in her um, majority opinion, that 25 years should be sufficient uh, to phase out the use of race in admissions. Gruder was decided in 2003, so that meant 2008, not too long from, uh, uh, from the 2003 that we're in today. Um, and then finally, uh, the court observed that, that in fact, if not in policy, both universities were using race to achieve quotas or in some sort of mechanical way. They pointed out that the percentage of African-American admittees had uh, fluctuated within a really narrow band around 10%. Uh, same with Hispanic um, uh, admittees. And uh, Asian admittees had also fluctuated uh, within a relatively narrow band in the uh, low 22, 22, 23 uh, percent. Um, and so uh, the use of a quota system or mechanical measures in that way um, violated Gruder and, uh, and so was, uh, was a fifth measure, a fifth basis for striking down Choosing between these two rationales, um, anti-classification and anti-subordination, it depends on a, a difficult and highly con contested empirical question, which is how much discrimination remains in the United States in US society. I mean, it's clear that things are better now um, than they were before the Civil War, they're better now than they were in the 1960s uh, when the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act were enacted to combat uh, the Jim Crow laws in the South and de facto discrimination in the North. Um, if one looks at the data, um, well, uh, African Americans have, on average, uh, lower average incomes. They have less, less access to capital, um, lower rates of home, own, home ownership, lower rates of um, high school graduation, and so on. Um, they're disproportionately grouped in lower performing urban uh, school systems. And this was actually enabled by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held in the San Antonio School District decision that it did not violate the Equal Protection Clause for school districts to be funded primarily by local property taxes, which meant that when uh, 
upper income whites fled from urban areas in the aftermath of anti-discrimination laws. Um, I mean, what you had is simply a, a replacement of de jure segregation, which with a geographical segregation in which suburban school districts uh, had many more resources than urban school districts. Uh, the data shows that um, there seems to be uh, uncontrolled racist bias in a, in a variety of governmental services, um, delivery of health care, uh, policing, uh, other social services. Anecdotally, one reads regularly about um, about manifestations of race discrimination, conscious or unconscious. There was an article in the New York Times about uh, uh, an African-American college professor in the East who uh, was putting his home up for sale and ordered an appraisal. Uh, the appraisal came in much lower than he expected. And so he changed out all the family pictures, which of course were African-American for pictures of a white family reordered an appraisal from a different company, and the appraisal came in higher. Um, one doesn't have to call appraisers racist in order to suggest, in order to conclude that there remains a high degree of at least un unconscious or subconscious bias in American society. And if that is true, then, um, then race neutral policies are, are not going to reach that. Uh, that was the whole um, justification rationale for the anti-subordination understanding of the Equal Protection Clause. Now, regrettably, uh, this question, how much discrimination remains in American society has become politicized and polarized. So um, on the one hand, you have uh, individuals arguing that um, that American society was built on slavery and that slavery and its vestiges remain throughout American society. And then, of course, conservatives on the right uh, push back against that and argue that um, you know, that the slaves were freed, we have anti-discrimination laws, and no discrimination remains in American society, and school children should not even be permitted to, to be taught uh, that there might be such, um, such vestiges of slavery and discrimination remaining in American society. So you have people arguing against uh, wokeism, uh, on the right and, you know, structural discrimination or critical uh, legal studies on the left. Um, but one way of thinking about this is, um, is whether slavery and Jim Crow and racial discrimination are a parenthesis in American society uh, or whether uh, they represent um, something that persists. Uh, the parenthesis theory is that the founders got everything right except slavery, and uh, we've now corrected for that. Slavery was abolished with the 13th Amendment. Discrimination was abolished by government with the 14th Amendment, and then uh, private discrimination has been eradicated by the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. And so you sort of have a bracketing of, of slavery and racial discrimination. Everything's good except this, and now this has been erased, so everything's good. Um, on, on the persistence theory, um, the idea here is that um, slavery pervaded the legal system, that is, it wasn't just the trafficking in human beings, but there was a whole superstructure of laws that were necessary in order to preserve slavery. Um, in order to prevent slaves from escaping, 
uh, African Americans were banned from uh, restaurants, inns, taverns, places like that, um, uh, which uh, which whites, of course, used to travel and which escaped slaves might have used to travel but did not. The Fugitive Slave Acts uh, are, uh, are a stain, frankly, on United States Supreme Court jurisprudence requiring Northern states to cooperate. So, um, regrettably, but I suppose inevitably, uh, these affirmative action cases from last week, these Students for Fair Admissions cases have uh, or will be understood as uh, the Supreme Court's having enlisted itself on the side of anti-wokeism and um, a, a general uh, sense that racial discrimination is not a continuing or persistent or major problem in the United States that needs to be combated by positive or affirmative uh, governmental action to eradicate. 